Chapter Twenty Two, Part Two of File Number One Thirteen by Emile Gaboriau. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Twenty Two, Part Two. Well, how he discovered the little attentions I had devoted to his letters, I can't imagine. You know how careful I am. I had put everything in perfect order, just as I found things I left them when, lo and behold, my noble marquis picks up each paper one at a time turns it over and smells it i was just thinking i would offer him a magnifying glass when all of a sudden he sprang up and with one kick sent his chair across the room and flew at me with his eyes flashing like two pistols somebody has been at my papers he shrieked this letter has been photographed Brr, i'm not a coward but i can tell you that my heart stood perfectly still i saw myself dead as caesar cut into mincemeat and says i to myself fanferlot excuse me dubois my friend you are lost dead and i thought of madame alexandre m verduret was buried in thought and paid no attention to the worthy joseph's analysis of his personal sensations what happened next said verduret after a few minutes why he was just as frightened as i was patron the rascal did not even dare to touch me to be sure i had taken the precaution to get out of his reach we talked with a large table between us while wondering what could have enabled him to discover the secret i defended myself with virtuous indignation i said it cannot be monsieur le marquis is mistaken who would dare touch his papers Bast, instead of listening to me he flourished an open letter and said this letter has been photographed here is proof of it and he pointed to a little yellow spot on the paper shrieking out look smell smell it you devil it is i forget the name he called it but some acid used by photographers i know i know said m verduret go on what next then patron we had a scene what a scene he ended by seizing me by the throat and shaking me like a plum tree saying he would shake me until i told him who i was what i knew and where i came from as if i knew myself i was obliged to account for every minute of my time since i had been in his service the devil was worse than a judge of instruction in his questions then he sent for the hotel porter who had charge of the front door and questioned him closely but in english so that i could not understand after a while he cooled down and when the boy was gone presented me with twenty francs saying i am sorry i was so sharp with you you are too stupid to have been guilty of the offence he said that did he he used those very words to my face patron and you think he meant what he said certainly i do the fat man smiled and whistled a little tune expressive of contempt if you think that he said clameron was right in his estimate of your brilliancy it was easy to see that joseph dubois was anxious to hear his patron's grounds for considering him stupid but dared not ask i suppose i am stupid if you think so said poor fanferlot humbly well after he had done blustering about the letters m le marquis dressed and went out he did not want his carriage but i saw him hire a cab at the hotel door i thought he had perhaps disappeared for ever but i was mistaken about five o'clock he returned as gay as a bullfinch during his absence i had telegraphed to you what you did not follow him i stayed on the spot in case of his return but one of our friends kept watch on him and this friend gave me a report of my dandy's movements first he went to a broker's then to the bank and discount office so he must be collecting his money to take a little trip is that all he did that is all patron but i must tell you how the rascals tried to shut up administratively you understand mademoiselle palmyre fortunately you had anticipated something of the kind and given orders to watch over her safety but for you she would now be in prison 
joseph looked up to the ceiling by way of trying to remember something more finding nothing there he said that is all i rather think monsieur patrigent will rub his hands with delight when i carry him my report he did not expect to see me any more and has no idea of the facts i have collected to swell the size of his file one thirteen there was a long silence joseph was right in supposing that the crisis had come m verduret was arranging his plan of battle while waiting for the report of nina now palmyre upon which depended his point of attack but joseph dubois began to grow restless and uneasy what must i do now patron he asked return to the hotel probably your master had noticed your absence but he will say nothing about it so continue here m verduret was interrupted by an exclamation from prosper who was standing near a window what is the matter he inquired there is clamorant cried prosper over there m verduret and joseph ran to the window where is he said joseph i don't see him there at the corner of the bridge behind that orange woman's stall prosper was right it was the noble marquis of clamorant who hid behind the stall was watching for his servant to come out of the archangel at first the quick-sighted verduret had some doubts whether it was the marquis who being skilled in these hazardous expeditions managed to conceal himself behind a pillar so as to elude detection but a moment came when elbowed by the pressing crowd he was obliged to come out on the pavement in full view of the window now don't you see i was right cried the cashier well said the amazed joseph i am amazed m verduret seemed not in the least surprised but quietly said the game needs hunting well joseph my boy do you still think that your noble master was duped by your acting injured innocence you assured me to the contrary patron said joseph in a humble tone and your opinion is more convincing than all the proofs in the world this pretended outburst of rage was premeditated on the part of your noble master knowing that he is being tracked he naturally wishes to discover who his adversaries are you can imagine how uncomfortable he must be at this uncertainty perhaps he thinks his pursuers are some of his old accomplices who being starved want a piece of his cake he will remain there until you come out then he will come in to find out who you are but patron i can go home without his seeing me yes i know you will climb the little wall separating the archangel from the wine merchant's yard and keep along the stationer's area until you reach the rue de la huchette poor joseph looked as if he had just received a bucket of ice-water upon his head exactly the way i was going patron he gasped out i heard that you knew every plank and door of all the houses in paris and it certainly must be so the fat man made no reply to joseph's admiring remarks he was thinking how he could catch clamorant as to the cashier he listened wonderingly watching these strangers who seemed determined to reinstate him in public opinion and punish his enemies while he himself stood by powerless and bewildered what their motives for befriending him could be he vainly tried to discover i will tell you what i can do said joseph after deep thought what is it i can innocently walk out of the front door and loaf along the street until i reach the hotel du louvre and then dame clamorant will come in and question madame alexandre whom you can instruct beforehand and she is smart enough to put any sharper off the track bad plan pronounced m verduret decidedly a scamp so compromised as clamorant is not easily put off the track now his eyes are opened he will be pretty hard to catch suddenly in a brief tone of authority which admitted of no contradiction the fat man said i have a way has clamorant since he found that his papers have been searched seen la gosse no patron perhaps he has written to him i'll bet you my head he has not having your orders to watch his correspondence i invented a little system which informs me every time he touches a pen during the last twenty-four hours the pens have not been touched 
Clemerand went out yesterday. But the man who followed him says he wrote nothing on the way. Then we have time yet, cried Verduret. Hurry, hurry. I give you fifteen minutes to make yourself ahead. You know the sort. I will watch the rascal until you come up. The delighted Joseph disappeared in a twinkling, while Prosper and M. Verduret remained at the window observing Clamorant, who, according to the movements of the crowd, was sometimes lost to sight, and sometimes just in front of the window, but was evidently determined not to quit his post until he had obtained the information he sought. "'Why do you devote yourself exclusively to the Marquis?' asked Prosper. "'Because, my friend,' replied M. Verduret, "'because... That is my business, and not yours. Joseph Dubois had been granted a quarter of an hour in which to metamorphose himself. Before ten minutes had elapsed, he reappeared. The dandified coachman with bergami whiskers, red vest, and foppish manners was replaced by a sinister-looking individual whose very appearance was enough to scare any rogue. His black cravat twisted around a paper collar and ornamented by an imitation diamond pin his long-tailed black coat buttoned up to the chin. His greasy hat and shiny boots and heavy cane revealed the employee of the Rue de Jérusalem as plainly as the shoulder straps mark a soldier. Joseph Dubois had vanished forever, and from his livery, phoenix-like and triumphant, arose the radiant Fanferlot, surnamed the Squirrel. When Fanferlot entered the room, Prosper uttered a cry of surprise and almost fright. He recognized the man who had assisted the commissary of police to examine the bank on the day of the robbery. M. Verduret examined his aid with a satisfied look and said, Not bad. There is enough of the police court air about you to alarm even an honest man. You understood me perfectly this time. Fanferlot was transported with delight at this compliment. What must I do now, patron? he inquired. Nothing difficult for an adroit man. But remember, upon the precision of our movements depends the success of my plan. Before arresting La Gosse, I wish to dispose of Clamorant. Now that the rascals are separated, the first thing to do is to prevent their coming together. I understand, said Fanferlot, snapping his little rat-like eyes. I am to create a diversion. Exactly. Go out by the Rue de la Huchette and hasten to St. Michel's Bridge. Loaf along the bank and finally sit on the steps of the quay so that Clamorant may know he is being watched. If he don't see you, do something to attract his attention. Parbleu, I will throw a stone in the water, said Fanferlot, rubbing his hands with delight at his own brilliant idea. As soon as Clamorant has seen you, continued M. Verduret, he will be alarmed and instantly decamp. Knowing there are reasons why the police should be after him, he will hasten to escape you. Then comes the time for you to keep wide awake. He is a slippery eel and cunning as a rat. I know all that. I was not born yesterday. So much the better. You can convince him of that. Well, knowing you are at his heels, he will not dare to return to the Hôtel du Louvre for fear of being called on by troublesome visitors. Now, it is very important that he should not return to the hotel. But suppose he does, said Fanferlot. M. Verduret thought for a minute and then said, It is not probable that he will do so, but if he should, you must wait until he comes out again and continue to follow him. But he won't enter the hotel. Very likely he will take the cars. But in that event, don't lose sight of him, no matter if you have to follow him to Siberia. Have you money with you? I will get some from Madame Alexandre. Very good. Ah, one more word. If the rascal takes the cars, send me word. If he beats about the bush until night, be on your guard, especially in lonely places. The desperado is capable of any enormity. If necessary, must I fire? Don't be rash. But if he attacks you, of course, defend yourself. Come, tis time you were gone. Dubois Fanferlot went out. Verduret and Prosper resumed their post of observation. 
why all this secrecy inquired prosper clamorant is charged with ten times worse crimes than i was ever accused of and yet my disgrace was made as public as possible don't you understand replied the fat man that i wish to separate the cause of raoul from that of the marquis but sh look clamorant had left his place near the orange woman's stand and approached the bridge where he seemed to be trying to make out some unexpected object ah said m verduret he has just discovered our man clamorant's uneasiness was quite apparent he walked forward a few steps as if intending to cross the bridge then suddenly turning around rapidly walked in the direction of the rue st jacques he is caught cried m verduret with delight at that moment the door opened and madame nina gypsy alias palmire chocareil entered poor nina each day spent in the service of madeleine seemed to have aged her a year tears had dimmed the brilliancy of her beautiful black eyes her rosy cheeks were pale and hollow and her merry smile was quite gone poor gypsy once so gay and spirited now crushed beneath the burden of her sorrows was the picture of misery prosper thought that wild with joy at seeing him and proud of having so nobly devoted herself to his interests nina would throw her arms around his neck and say how much she loved him to his surprise nina scarcely spoke to him although his every thought had been devoted to madeleine since he discovered the reasons for her cruelty he was hurt by nina's cold manner the girl stood looking at m verduret with a mixture of fear and devotion like a poor dog that has been cruelly treated by its master he however was kind and gentle in his manner toward her well my dear he said encouragingly what news do you bring me something is going on at the house monsieur and i have been trying to get here to tell you at last mademoiselle madeleine made an excuse for sending me out you must thank mademoiselle madeleine for her confidence in me i suppose she carried out the plan we decided upon yes monsieur she receives the marquis of clamorant's visits since the marriage has been decided upon he comes every day and mademoiselle receives him with kindness he seems to be delighted these answers filled prosper with anger and alarm the poor young man not comprehending the intricate moves of m verduret felt as if he were being tossed about from pillar to post and made the tool and laughing-stock of everybody what he cried this worthless marquis of clamorant an assassin and a thief allowed to visit at m fauvel's and pay his addresses to madeleine where are the promises monsieur which you have made have you merely been amusing yourself by raising my hopes to dash them enough interrupted m verduret harshly you are too green to understand anything my friend if you are incapable of helping yourself at least have sense enough to refrain from importuning those who are working for you do you not think you have already done sufficient mischief having administered this rebuke he turned to gypsy and said in softer tones go on my child what have you discovered nothing positive monsieur but enough to make me nervous and fearful of impending danger i am not certain but suspect from appearances that some dreadful catastrophe is about to happen it may only be a presentiment i cannot get any information from madame fauvel she refuses to answer any hints and moves about like a ghost never opening her lips she seems to be afraid of her niece and to be trying to conceal something from her what about m fauvel i was just about to tell you monsieur some fearful misfortune has happened to him you may depend upon it he wanders about as if he had lost his mind something certainly occurred yesterday his voice even is changed he is so harsh and irritable that mademoiselle and m lucien were wondering what could be the matter with him he seems to be on the eve of giving way to a burst of anger and there is a wild strange look about his eyes especially when he looks at madame yesterday evening when m de clamorant was announced he jumped up and hurried out of the room saying that he had some work to do in his study a triumphant exclamation from m verduret interrupted madame gypsy he was radiant eh 
he said to prosper forgetting his bad humour of a few minutes before eh what did i tell you he has evidently been afraid to give way to his first impulse of course he has he is now seeking for proofs of your assertions he must have them by this time did the ladies go out yesterday yes a part of the day what became of m fauvel the ladies took me with them we left m fauvel at home not a doubt of it cried the fat man he looked for proofs and found them too your letter told him exactly where to go ah prosper that unfortunate letter gives more trouble than everything else together these words seemed to throw a sudden light on madame gypsy's mind i understand it now she exclaimed monsieur fauvel knows everything that is he thinks he knows everything and what he has been led to fear and thinks he has discovered is worse than the true state of affairs that accounts for the order which m cavaillon overheard him give to his servant-man evariste what order he told evariste to bring every letter that came to the house no matter to whom addressed into his study and hand them to him saying that if this order was disobeyed he should be instantly discharged at what time was this order given asked m verduret yesterday afternoon that is what i was afraid of cried m verduret he has clearly made up his mind what course to pursue and is keeping quiet so as to make his vengeance more sure the question is have we still time to counteract his projects have we time to convince him that the anonymous letter was incorrect in some of its assertions he tried to hit upon some plan for repairing the damage done by prosper's foolish letter thank you for your information my dear child he said after a long silence i will decide at once what steps to take for it will never do to sit quietly and let things go on in this way return home without delay and be careful of everything you say and do for m fauvel suspects you of being in the plot send me word of anything that happens no matter how insignificant it may be nina thus dismissed did not move but said timidly what about caldas monsieur this was the third time during the last fortnight that prosper had heard this name caldas the first time it had been whispered in his ear by a respectable-looking middle-aged man who offered his protection one day when passing through the police office passage the second time the judge of instruction had mentioned it in connection with gypsy's history prosper thought over all the men he had ever been connected with but could recall none named caldas the impassable m verduret started and trembled at the mention of this name but quickly recovering himself said i promise to find him for you and i will keep my promise now you must go good morning it was twelve o'clock and m verduret suddenly remembered that he was hungry he called madame alexandre and the beaming hostess of the archangel soon placed a tempting breakfast before prosper and his friend both the savoury broiled oysters and flaky biscuit failed to smooth the perplexed brow of m verduret to the eager questions and complimentary remarks of madame alexandre he answered chut chut let me alone keep quiet for the first time since he had known the fat man prosper saw him betray anxiety and hesitation he remained silent as long as he could and then uneasily said i am afraid i have embarrassed you very much monsieur yes you have dreadfully embarrassed me replied m verduret what on earth to do now i don't know shall i hasten matters or keep quiet and wait for the next move and i am bound by a sacred promise come we had better go and advise with the judge of instruction he can assist me come with me let us hurry End of chapter twenty two Chapter Twenty Three of File Number One Thirteen by Emile Gaboriau. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Twenty Three. As M. Verduret had anticipated, Prosper's letter had a terrible effect upon M. Fauvel. 
it was toward nine o'clock in the morning and m fauvel had just entered his study when his mail was brought in after opening a dozen business letters his eyes fell on the fatal missive sent by prosper something about the writing struck him as peculiar it was evidently a disguised hand and although owing to the fact of his being a millionaire he was in the habit of receiving anonymous communications sometimes abusive but generally begging for money this particular letter filled him with an indefinite presentiment of evil a cold chill ran through his heart and he dreaded to open it with absolute certainty that he was about to learn of a new calamity he broke the seal and opening the coarse cafe paper was shocked by the following words dear sir you have handed your cashier over to the law and you acted properly convinced as you were of his dishonesty but if it was he who took three hundred and fifty thousand francs from your safe was it he also who took madame fauvel's diamonds this was a terrible blow to a man whose life hitherto had been an unbroken chain of prosperity who could recall the past without one bitter regret without remembering any sorrow deep enough to bring forth a tear what his wife deceive him and among all men to choose one vile enough to rob her of her jewels and force her to be his accomplice in the ruin of an innocent young man for did not the letter before him assert this to be the fact and to tell him how to convince himself of its truth m fauvel was as bewildered as if he had been knocked on the head with a club it was impossible for his scattered ideas to take in the enormity of what those dreadful words intimated he seemed to be mentally and physically paralyzed as he sat there staring blankly at the letter but this stupefaction suddenly changed to indignant rage what a fool i am he cried to listen to such base lies such malicious charges against the purest woman whom god ever sent to bless a man and he angrily crumpled up the letter and threw it into the empty fireplace saying i will forget having read it i will not soil my mind by letting it dwell upon such turpitude he said this and he thought it but for all that he could not open the rest of his letters the anonymous missive stood before his eyes in letters of fire and drove every other thought from his mind that penetrating clinging all corroding warm suspicion had taken possession of his soul and as he leaned over his desk with his face buried in his hands thinking over many things which had lately occurred insignificant at the time but fearfully ominous now this unwillingly admitted germ of suspicion grew and expanded until it became certainty but resolved that he would not think of his wife in connection with so vile a deed he imagined a thousand wild excuses for the mischief-maker who took this mode of annoying him of course there was no truth in his assertions but from curiosity he would like to know who had written it and yet suppose merciful god can it be true he wildly cried as the idea of his wife's guilt would obstinately return to his troubled mind thinking that the writing might throw some light on the mystery he started up and tremblingly picked up the fatal letter out of the ashes carefully smoothing it out he laid it on his desk and studied the heavy strokes light strokes and capitals of every word it must be from some of my clerks he finally said some one who is angry with me for refusing to raise his salary or perhaps it is the one i dismissed the other day clinging to this idea he thought over all the young men in his bank but not one could he believe capable of resorting to so base a vengeance then he wondered where the letter had been posted thinking this might throw some light upon the mystery he looked at the envelope and read the postmark rue du cardinal le moine this fact told him nothing once more he read the letter spelling over each word and trying to put a different construction on the horrible phrases that stared him in the face it is generally agreed that an anonymous letter should be treated with silent contempt and cast aside as the malicious lies of a coward who dares not say to a man's face what he secretly commits to paper and forces upon him this is all very well in theory but it is difficult to practice when the anonymous letter comes you throw it in the fire it burns but although the paper is destroyed by the flames doubt remains suspicion arises from its ashes like a subtle poison penetrates the inmost recesses of the mind weakens its holiest beliefs and destroys its faith 
the trail of the serpent is left the wife suspected no matter how unjustly is no longer the wife in whom her husband trusted as he would trust himself the pure being who was above suspicion no longer exists suspicion no matter whence the source has irrevocably tarnished the brightness of his idol unable to struggle any longer against these conflicting doubts m fauvel determined to resolve them by showing the letter to his wife but a torturing thought more terrible than any he had yet suffered made him sink back in his chair in despair suppose it be true he muttered to himself suppose i have been miserably duped by confiding in my wife i shall put her on her guard and lose all chance of discovering the truth thus were realized all verdurin's presumptions he had said if m fauvel does not yield to his first impulse if he stops to reflect we have time to repair the harm done after long and painful meditation the banker finally decided to wait and watch his wife it was a hard struggle for a man of his frank upright nature to play the part of a domestic spy and a jealous husband accustomed to give way to sudden bursts of anger but quickly mastering them he would find it difficult to be compelled to preserve his self-restraint no matter how dreadful the discoveries might be when he collected the proofs of guilt one by one he must impose silence upon his resentment until fully assured of possessing certain evidence there was one simple means of ascertaining whether the diamonds had been pawned if the letter lied in this instance he would treat it with the scorn it deserved if on the other hand it should prove to be true at this moment the servant announced breakfast and m fauvel looked in the glass before leaving his study to see if his face betrayed the emotion he felt he was shocked at the haggard features which it reflected have i no nerve he said to himself oh i must and shall control my feelings until i find out the truth at table he talked incessantly so as to escape any questions from his wife who he saw was uneasy at the sight of his pale face but all the time he was talking he was casting over in his mind expedients of getting his wife out of the house long enough for him to search her bureau at last he asked madame fauvel if she were going out before dinner yes said she the weather is dreadful but madeleine and i must do some shopping at what time shall you go immediately after breakfast he drew a long breath as if relieved of a great weight in a short time he would know the truth his uncertainty was so torturing to the unhappy man that he preferred the most dreadful reality to his present agony breakfast over he lighted a cigar but did not remain in the dining-room to smoke it as was his habit he went into his study to try and compose his nerves he took the precaution to send lucien on a message so as to be alone in the house after the lapse of half an hour he heard the carriage roll away with his wife and niece hurrying into madame fauvel's room he opened the drawer of the chiffonnier where she kept her jewels the last dozen or more leather and velvet boxes containing superb sets of jewellery which he had presented to her were gone twelve boxes remained he nervously opened them they were all empty the anonymous letter had told the truth oh it cannot be he gasped in broken tones oh no no he wildly pulled open every drawer in the vain hope of finding them packed away perhaps she kept them elsewhere he tried to hope that she had sent them to be reset but no they were all superbly set in the latest fashion and moreover she never would have sent them all at once he looked again nothing not one jewel could he find he remembered that he had asked his wife at the jean didier ball why she did not wear her diamonds and she had replied with a smile oh what is the use everybody knows them so well and besides they don't suit my costume yes she had made this answer without blushing without showing the slightest sign of agitation or shame what barefaced impudence what base hypocrisy concealed beneath an innocent confiding manner and she had been thus deceiving him for twenty years but suddenly a gleam of hope penetrated his confused mind slight barely possible still a straw to cling to 
perhaps valentine has put her diamonds in madeleine's room without stopping to consider the indelicacy of what he was about to do he hurried into the young girl's room and pulled open one drawer after another what did he find not madame fauvel's diamonds but madeleine's seven or eight boxes also empty great heavens was this gentle girl whom he had treated as a daughter an accomplice in this deed of shame had she contributed her jewellery to add to the disgrace of the roof that sheltered her this last blow was almost too much for the miserable man he sank almost lifeless into a chair and wringing his hands groaned over the wreck of his happiness was this the happy future to which he had looked forward was the fabric of his honour well-being and domestic bliss to be dashed to the earth and forever lost in a day were his twenty years labour and high standing to end thus in shame and sorrow apparently nothing was changed in his existence he was not materially injured he could not reach forth his hand and heal or revenge the smarting wound the objects around him were unchanged everything went on in the outside world just as it had gone on during the last twenty years and yet what a horrible change had taken place in his own heart while the world envied his prosperity and happiness here he sat more heart-sore and wearied of life than the worst criminal that ever stood before the inquisition what valentine the pure young girl whom he had loved and married in spite of her poverty in spite of her cold offering of calm affection in return for his passionate devotion valentine the tender loving wife who before a year of married life had rolled by so often assured him that her affection had grown into deep confiding love that her devotion had grown stronger every day and that her only prayer was that god would take them both together since life would be a burden without her noble husband to shield and cherish her could she have been acting a lie for twenty years she the darling wife the mother of his sons his sons good god were they his sons if she could deceive him now when she was silver-haired had she not deceived him when she was young not only did he suffer in the present but the uncertainty of the past tortured his soul he was like a man who was told that the exquisite wine he has drank contains poison confidence is never half way it is or it is not his confidence was gone his faith was dead the wretched banker had rested his every hope and happiness on the love of his wife believing that she had proved faithless that she had played him false and was unworthy of trust he admitted no possibility of peaceful joy and felt tempted to seek consolation from self-destruction what had he to live for now save to mourn over the ashes of the past but this dejection did not last long indignant anger and thirst for vengeance made him start up and swear that he would lose no time in vain regrets m fauvel well knew that the fact of the diamonds being stolen was not sufficient ground upon which to bring an accusation against any of the accomplices he must possess overwhelming proofs before taking any active steps success depended upon present secrecy he began by calling his valet and ordering him to bring to him every letter that should come to the house he then wrote to a notary at st remy for minute and authentic information about the lagos family and especially about raoul finally following the advice of the anonymous letter he went to the prefecture of police hoping to obtain a biography of clameron but the police fortunately for many people are as discreetly silent as the grave they guard their secrets as a miser his treasure nothing but an order from the chief judge could open those formidable green boxes and reveal their secrets m fauvel was politely asked what motives urged him to inquire into the past life of a french citizen and as he declined to state his reasons the chief of police told him he had better apply to the procureur for the desired information this advice he could not follow he had sworn that the secret of his wrongs should be confined to the three persons interested he chose to avenge his own injuries to be alone the judge and executioner he returned home more angry than ever there he found the dispatch answering the one which he had sent to st remy it was as follows 
the Lagos are very poor, and there has never been any member of the family named Raoul. Madame Lagos had no son, only two daughters. This information dashed his last hope the banker thought when he discovered his wife's infamy that she had sinned as deeply as a woman could sin but he now saw that she had practised a system more shocking than the crime itself wretched creature he cried with anguish in order to see her lover constantly she dared introduce him to me under the name of a nephew who never existed she had the shameless courage to bring him beneath her husband's roof and seat him at my fireside between my sons and i confiding fool that i was welcomed the villain and lent him money nothing could equal the pain of wounded pride and mortification which he suffered at the thought that raoul and madame fauvel had amused themselves with his good-natured credulity and obtuseness nothing but death could wipe out an injury of this nature but the very bitterness of his resentment enabled him to restrain himself until the time for punishment came with grim satisfaction he promised himself that his acting would be as successful as theirs that day he succeeded in concealing his agitation and kept up a flow of talk at dinner but at about nine o'clock when clamarant called on the ladies he rushed from the house for fear that he would be unable to control his indignation at the sight of this destroyer of his happiness and did not return home until late in the night the next day he reaped the fruit of his prudence among the letters which his valet brought him at noon was one bearing the postmark of vesinet he carefully opened the envelope and read dear aunt it is imperatively necessary for me to see you to-day so do not fail to come to vesinet i will explain why i give you this trouble instead of calling at your house raoul i have them now cried m fauvel trembling with satisfaction at the near prospect of vengeance eager to lose no time he opened a drawer took out a revolver and examined the hammer to see if it worked easily he imagined himself alone but a vigilant eye was watching his movements gypsy immediately upon her return from the archangel stationed herself at the keyhole of the study door and saw all that occurred m fauvel laid the pistol on the mantelpiece and nervously resealed the letter which he then took to the box where the letters were usually left not wishing any one to know that raoul's letter had passed through his hands he was only absent two minutes but inspired by the imminence of the danger gypsy darted into the study and rapidly extracted the balls from the revolver thank heaven she murmured this peril is averted and m verduret will now perhaps have time to prevent a murder i must send cavaillon to tell him she hurried into the bank and sent the clerk with a message telling him to leave it with madame alexandre if m verduret had left the hotel an hour later madame fauvel ordered her carriage and went out m fauvel jumped into a hackney coach and followed her god grant that m verduret may reach there in time cried nina to herself otherwise madame fauvel and raoul are lost End of chapter 23
and after making several rough speeches as if trying to provoke a quarrel finally threw a card in his face saying its owner was ready to grant him satisfaction when and where he pleased raoul rushed toward the man to chastise him on the spot but his friends held him back telling him that it would be much more gentlemanly to run a sword through his vulgar hide than have a scuffle in a public place very well then you will hear from me to-morrow he said scornfully to his assailant wait at your hotel until i send two friends to arrange the matter with you as soon as the stranger had left raoul recovered from his excitement and began to wonder what could have been the motive for this evidently premeditated insult picking up the card of the bully he read w h b jacobson formerly garibaldian volunteer ex-officer of the army of the south italy america thirty rue Leoni raoul had seen enough of the world to know that these heroes who cover their visiting cards with titles have very little glory elsewhere than in their own conceit still the insult had been offered in the presence of others and no matter who the offender was it must be noticed early the next morning raoul sent two of his friends to make arrangements for a duel he gave them mr jacobson's address and told them to report at the hotel du louvre where he would wait for them having dismissed his friends raoul went out to find out something about m jacobson and being an expert at the business of unravelling plots and snares he determined to discover who was at the bottom of this duel into which he had been decoyed the information obtained was not very promising m jacobson who lived in a very suspicious-looking little hotel whose inmates were chiefly women of light character was described to him as an eccentric gentleman whose mode of life was a problem difficult to solve no one knew his means of support he reigned despotically in the hotel went out a great deal never came in until midnight and seemed to have no capital to live on save his military titles and a talent for carrying out whatever was undertaken for his own benefit that being his character thought raoul i cannot see what object he can have in picking a quarrel with me what good will it do him to run a sword through my body not the slightest and moreover his pugnacious conduct is apt to draw the attention of the police who from what i hear are the last people this warrior would like to have after him therefore he must have some reason for pursuing me and i must find out what it is the result of his meditations was that raoul upon his return to the hotel du louvre did not mention a word of his adventure to clamorant whom he found already up at half past eight his seconds arrived m jacobson had selected the sword and would fight that very hour in the woods of vincennes well come along cried raoul gaily i accept the gentleman's conditions they found the garibaldian waiting and after an interchange of a few thrusts raoul was slightly wounded in the right shoulder the ex-superior officer of the south wished to continue the combat but raoul's seconds brave young men declared that honour was satisfied and that they had no intention of subjecting their friend's life to unnecessary hazards the ex-officer was forced to admit that this was but fair and unwillingly retired from the field raoul went home delighted at having escaped with nothing more serious than a little loss of blood and resolved to keep clear of all so-called garibaldians in the future in fact a night's reflection had convinced him that clamorant was the instigator of the two attempts to kill him madame fauvel having told him what conditions madeleine placed on her consent to marriage raoul instantly saw how necessary his removal would be now that he was an impediment in the way of clamorant's success he recalled a thousand little remarks and events of the last few days and on skilfully questioning the marquis had his suspicions changed into certainty this conviction that the man whom he had so materially assisted in his criminal plans was so basely ungrateful as to turn against him and hire assassins to murder him in cold blood inspired in raoul a resolution to take speedy vengeance upon his treacherous accomplice and at the same time ensure his own safety this treason seemed monstrous to raoul he was as yet not sufficiently experienced in ruffianism to know that one villain always sacrifices another to advance his own projects he was credulous enough to believe in the adage there's honour among thieves his rage was naturally mingled with fright well knowing that his life hung by a thread when it was threatened by a daring scoundrel like clamorant 
he had twice miraculously escaped a third attempt would more than likely prove fatal knowing his accomplice's nature raoul saw himself surrounded by snares he saw death before him in every form he was equally afraid of going out and of remaining at home he only ventured with the most suspicious caution into the most public places he feared poison more than the assassin's knife and imagined that every dish placed before him tasted of strychnine as this life of torture was intolerable he determined to anticipate a struggle which he felt must terminate in the death of either clamorant or himself and if he were doomed to die to be first revenged if he went down clamorant should go too better kill the devil than be killed by him in his days of poverty raoul had often risked his life to obtain a few guineas and would not have hesitated to make short work of a person like clamorant but with money prudence had come he wished to enjoy his four hundred thousand francs without being compromised by committing a murder which might be discovered he therefore began to devise some other means of getting rid of his dreaded accomplice meanwhile he devoted his thoughts to some discreet way of thwarting clamorant's marriage with madeleine he was sure that he would thus strike him to the heart and this was at least a satisfaction raoul was persuaded that by openly siding with madeleine and her aunt he could save them from clamorant's clutches having fully resolved upon this course he wrote a note to madame fauville asking for an interview the poor woman hastened to visinet convinced that some new misfortune was in store for her her alarm was groundless she found raoul more tender and affectionate than he had ever been he saw the necessity of reassuring her and winning his old place in her forgiving heart before making his disclosures he succeeded the poor lady had a smiling and happy air as she sat in an armchair with raoul kneeling beside her i have distressed you too long my dear mother he said in his softest tones but i repent sincerely now listen to my he had not time to say more the door was violently thrown open and raoul springing to his feet was confronted by m fauvel the banker had a revolver in his hand and was deadly pale it was evident that he was making a superhuman effort to remain calm like a judge whose duty it is to justly punish crime ah he said with a horrible laugh you look surprised you did not expect me you thought that my imbecile credulity ensured your safety raoul had the courage to place himself before madame fauvel and to stand prepared to receive the expected bullet i assure you uncle he began enough interrupted the banker with an angry gesture let me hear no more infamous falsehoods end this acting of which i am no longer the dupe i swear to you spare yourself the trouble of denying anything i know all i know who pawned my wife's diamonds i know who committed the robbery for which an innocent man was arrested and imprisoned madame fauvel white with terror fell upon her knees at last it had come the dreadful day had come vainly had she added falsehood to falsehood vainly had she sacrificed herself and others all was discovered she saw that all was lost and wringing her hands she tearfully moaned pardon andre i beg you forgive me at these heart-broken tones the banker shook like a leaf this voice brought before him the twenty years of happiness which he had owed to this woman who had always been the mistress of his heart whose slightest wish had been his law and who by a smile or a frown could make him the happiest or the most miserable of men alas those days were over now could this wretched woman crouching at his feet be his beloved valentine the pure innocent girl whom he had found secluded in the chateau of la verberie who had never loved any other than himself could this be the cherished wife whom he had worshipped for so many years the memory of his lost happiness was too much for the stricken man he forgot the present and the past and was almost melted to forgiveness unhappy woman he murmured unhappy woman what have i done that you should thus betray me 
ah my only fault was loving you too deeply and letting you see it one wearies of everything in this world even happiness did pure domestic joys pall upon you and weary you driving you to seek the excitement of sinful passion were you so tired of the atmosphere of respect and affection which surrounded you that you must needs risk your honour and mine by braving public opinion oh into what an abyss you have fallen valentine and oh my god if you were wearied by my constant devotion had the thought of your children no power to restrain your evil passions could you not remain untarnished for their sake m fauvel spoke slowly with painful effort as if each word choked him raoul who listened with attention saw that if the banker knew some things he certainly did not know all he saw that erroneous information had misled the unhappy man and that he was still a victim of false appearances he determined to convince him of the mistake under which he was laboring and said monsieur i hope you will listen but the sound of raoul's voice was sufficient to break the charm silence cried the banker with an angry oath silence for some moments nothing was heard but the sobs of madame fauvel i came here continued the banker with the intention of killing you both but i cannot kill a woman and i will not kill an unarmed man raoul once more tried to speak let me finish interrupted m fauvel your life is in my hands the law excuses the vengeance of an injured husband but i refuse to take advantage of it i see on your mantle a revolver similar to mine take it and defend yourself never defend yourself cried the banker raising his arm if you do not feeling the barrel of m fauvel's revolver touch his breast raoul in self-defence seized his own pistol and prepared to fire stand in that corner of the room and i will stand in this continued the banker and when the clock strikes which will be in a few seconds we will both fire they took the places designated and stood perfectly still but the horror of the scene was too much for madame fauvel to witness any longer without interposing she understood but one thing her son and her husband were about to kill each other before her very eyes fright and horror gave her strength to start up and rush between the two men for god's sake have mercy andre she cried wringing her hands with anguish let me tell you everything don't kill this burst of maternal love m fauvel thought the pleadings of a criminal woman defending her lover he roughly seized his wife by the arm and thrust her aside saying with indignant scorn get out of the way but she would not be repulsed rushing up to raoul she threw her arms around him and said to her husband kill me and me alone for i am the guilty one at these words m fauvel glared at the guilty pair and deliberately taking aim fired neither raoul nor madame fauvel moved the banker fired a second time then a third he cocked the pistol for a fourth shot when a man rushed into the room snatched the pistol from the banker's hand and throwing him on the sofa ran toward madame fauvel this man was m verduret who had been warned by cavaillon but did not know that madame gypsy had extracted the balls from m fauvel's revolver thank heaven he cried she is unhurt how dare you interfere cried the banker who by this time had joined the group i have the right to avenge my honour when it has been degraded the villain shall die m verduret seized the banker's wrists in a vice-like grasp and whispered in his ear thank god you are saved from committing a terrible crime the anonymous letter deceived you in violent situations like this all the untoward strange attending circumstances appear perfectly natural to the participators whose passions have already carried them beyond the limits of social propriety thus m fauvel never once thought of asking this stranger who he was and where he came from he heard and understood but one fact the anonymous letter had lied but but my wife confesses she is guilty he stammered 
so she is replied m verduret but not of the crime you imagine do you know who that man is that you attempted to kill her lover no her son the words of this stranger showing his intimate knowledge of the private affairs of all present seemed to confound and frighten raoul more than m fauvel's threats had done yet he had sufficient presence of mind to say it is the truth the banker looked wildly from raoul to m verduret then fastening his haggard eyes on his wife exclaimed it is false you are all conspiring to deceive me proofs you shall have proofs replied m verduret but first listen and rapidly with his wonderful talent for exposition he related the principal points of the plot he had discovered the true state of the case was terribly distressing to m fauvel but nothing compared with what he had suspected his throbbing yearning heart told him that he still loved his wife why should he punish a fault committed so many years ago and atoned for by twenty years of devotion and suffering for some moments after m verduret had finished his explanation m fauvel remained silent so many strange events had happened rapidly following each other in succession and culminating in the shocking scene which had just taken place that m fauvel seemed to be too bewildered to think clearly if his heart counselled pardon and forgetfulness wounded pride and self-respect demanded vengeance if raoul the baleful witness the living proof of a far-off sin were not in existence m fauvel would not have hesitated gaston de clameron was dead he would have held out his arms to his wife and said come to my heart your sacrifices for my honour shall be your absolution let the sad past be forgotten but the sight of raoul froze the words upon his lips so this is your son he said to his wife this man who has plundered you and robbed me madame fauvel was unable to utter a word in reply to these reproachful words oh said m verduret madame will tell you that this young man is the son of gaston de clameron she has never doubted it but the truth is what that in order to swindle her he has perpetrated a gross imposture during the last few minutes raoul had been quietly creeping toward the door hoping to escape while no one was thinking of him but m verduret who anticipated his intention was watching him out of the corner of one eye and stopped him just as he was about to leave the room not so fast my pretty youth he said dragging him into the middle of the room it is not polite to leave us so unceremoniously let us have a little conversation before parting a little explanation will be edifying the jeering words and mocking manner of m verduret made raoul turn deadly pale and start back as if confronted by a phantom the clown he gasped the same friend said the fat man ah now that you recognize me i confess that the clown and myself are one and the same yes i am the mountebank of the jean didier ball here is proof of it and turning up his sleeve he showed a deep cut on his arm i think that this recent wound will convince you of my identity he continued i imagine you know the villain that gave me this little decoration that night i was walking along the rue Bourdalou that being the case you know i have a slight claim upon you and shall expect you to relate to us your little story but raoul was so terrified that he could not utter a word your modesty keeps you silent said m verduret bravo modesty becomes talent and for one of your age you certainly have displayed a talent for knavery m fauvel listened without understanding a word of what was said into what dark depths of shame have we fallen he groaned reassure yourself monsieur replied m verduret with great respect after what i have been constrained to tell you what remains to be said is a mere trifle i will finish the story on leaving Mion, who had given him a full account of the misfortunes of mademoiselle valentine de la verberie clamorant hastened to london 
he had no difficulty in finding the farmer's wife to whom the old countess had entrusted gaston's son but here an unexpected disappointment greeted him he learned that the child whose name was registered on the parish books as raoul valentin wilson had died of the croup when eighteen months old did any one state such a fact as that interrupted raoul it is false it was not only stated but proved my pretty youth replied m verduret you don't suppose i am a man to trust to verbal testimony do you he drew from his pocket several officially stamped documents with red seals attached and laid them on the table these are the declarations of the nurse her husband and four witnesses here is an extract from the register of births this is a certificate of registry of his death and all these are authenticated at the french embassy now are you satisfied young man what next inquired m fauvel the next step was this replied m verduret clameron finding that the child was dead supposed that he could in spite of this disappointment obtain money from madame fauvel he was mistaken his first attempt failed having an inventive turn of mind he determined that the child should come to life among this large circle of rascally acquaintances he selected a young fellow to personate raoul valentin wilson and the chosen one stands before you madame fauvel was in a pitiable state and yet she began to feel a ray of hope her acute anxiety had so long tortured her that the truth was a relief she would thank heaven if this wicked man was proved to be no son of hers can this be possible she murmured can it be impossible cried the banker an infamous plot like this could not be executed in our midst all this is false said raoul boldly it is a lie m verduret turned to raoul and bowing with ironical respect said monsieur desires proofs does he monsieur shall certainly have convincing ones i have just left a friend of mine m palot who brought me valuable information from london now my young gentleman i will tell you the little story he told me and then you can give your opinion of it in eighteen forty seven lord murray a wealthy and generous nobleman had a jockey named spencer of whom he was very fond at the epsom races this jockey was thrown from his horse and killed lord murray grieved over the loss of his favourite and having no children of his own declared his intention of adopting spencer's son who was then but four years old thus james spencer was brought up in affluence as heir to the immense wealth of the noble lord he was a handsome intelligent boy and gave satisfaction to his protector until he was sixteen years of age when he became intimate with a worthless set of people and turned out badly lord murray who was very indulgent pardoned many grave faults but one fine morning he discovered that his adopted son had been imitating his signature upon some checks he indignantly dismissed him from his house and told him never to show his face again james spencer had been living in london about four years managing to support himself by gambling and swindling when he met clameron who offered him twenty-five thousand francs to play a part in a little comedy which he had arranged to suit the actors you are a detective interrupted raoul the fat man smiled grimly at present he replied i am merely a friend of prosper Bertomy. it depends entirely upon your behaviour which character i appear in while settling up this little affair what do you expect me to do restore the three hundred and fifty thousand francs which you have stolen the young rascal hesitated a moment and then said the money is in this room very good this frankness is creditable and will benefit you i know that the money is in this room and also exactly where it is to be found be kind enough to look behind that cupboard and you will find the three hundred and fifty thousand francs raoul saw that his game was lost he tremblingly went to the cupboard and pulled out several bundles of banknotes and an enormous package of pawnbroker's tickets very well done said m verduret as he carefully examined the money and papers 
this is the most sensible step you ever took raoul relied on this moment when everybody's attention would be absorbed by the money to make his escape he slid toward the door gently opened it slipped out and locked it on the outside the key being still in the lock he has escaped cried m fauvel naturally replied m verduret without even looking up i thought he would have sense enough to do that but is he to go unpunished my dear sir would you have this affair become a public scandal do you wish your wife's name to be brought into a case of this nature before the police court oh monsieur then the best thing you can do is to let the rascal go scot-free here are receipts for all the articles which he has pawned so that we should consider ourselves fortunate he has kept fifty thousand francs but that is all the better for you this sum will enable him to leave france and we shall never see him again like every one else m fauvel yielded to the ascendancy of m verduret gradually he had awakened to the true state of affairs prospective happiness no longer seemed impossible and he felt that he was indebted to the man before him for more than life but for m verduret where would have been his honour and domestic peace with earnest gratitude he seized m verduret's hand as if to carry it to his lips and said in broken tones oh monsieur how can i ever find words to express how deeply i appreciate your kindness how can i ever repay the great service you have rendered me m verduret reflected a moment and then said if you feel under any obligations to me monsieur you have it in your power to return them i have a favour to ask of you a favour you ask of me speak monsieur you have but to name it my fortune and life are at your disposal i will not hesitate then to explain myself i am prosper's friend and deeply interested in his future you can exonerate him from this infamous charge of robbery you can restore him to his honourable position you can do more than this monsieur he loves mademoiselle madeleine madeleine shall be his wife monsieur interrupted the banker i give you my word of honour and i will so publicly exonerate him that not a shadow of suspicion will rest upon his name i will place him in a position which will prevent slander from reproaching him with the painful remembrance of my fatal error the fat man quietly took up his hat and cane as if he had been paying an ordinary morning call and turned to leave the room after saying good morning but seeing the weeping woman raise her clasped hands appealingly toward him he said hesitatingly monsieur excuse my intruding any advice but madame fauvel andre murmured the wretched wife andre the banker hesitated a moment then following the impulse of his heart ran to his wife and clasping her in his arms he said tenderly no i will not be foolish enough to struggle against my deep-rooted love i do not pardon valentine i forget i forget all m verduret had nothing more to do at vesinet without taking leave of the banker he quietly left the room and jumping into his cab ordered the driver to return to paris and to drive to the hotel du louvre as rapidly as possible his mind was filled with anxiety about clamarant he knew that raoul would give him no more trouble the young rogue was probably taking his passage for some foreign land at that very moment but clamarant should not escape unpunished and how this punishment can be brought about without compromising madame fauvel was the problem to be solved m verduret thought over the various cases similar to this but not one of his former expedients could be applied to the present circumstances he could not deliver the villain over to justice without involving madame fauvel after long thought he decided that an accusation of poisoning must come from oloron he would go there and work upon public opinion so that to satisfy the townspeople the authorities would order a post-mortem examination of gaston but this mode of proceeding required time and clamarant would certainly escape before another day passed over his head 
he was too experienced a knave to remain on slippery ground now that his eyes were open to the danger which menaced him it was almost dark when the carriage stopped in front of the hotel du louvre m verduret noticed a crowd of people collected together in groups eagerly discussing some exciting event which seemed to have just taken place although the policeman attempted to disperse the crowd by authoritatively ordering them to move on move on they would merely separate in one spot to join a more clamorous group a few yards off what has happened demanded m verduret of a lounger near by the strangest thing you ever heard of replied the man yes i saw him with my own eyes he first appeared at the seventh story window he was only half dressed some men tried to seize him but bast with the agility of a squirrel he jumped out upon the roof shrieking murder murder the recklessness of his conduct led me to suppose the gossip stopped short in his narrative very much surprised and vexed his questioner had vanished if it should be clamorant thought m verduret if terror has deranged that brain so capable of working out great crimes fate must have interposed while thus talking to himself he elbowed his way through the crowded courtyard of the hotel at the foot of the staircase he found m fanferlot and three peculiar-looking individuals standing together as if waiting for some one well cried m verduret what is the matter with laudable emulation the four men rushed forward to report to their superior officer patron they all began at once silence said the fat man with an oath one at a time quick what is the matter the matter is this patron said fanferlot dejectedly i am doomed to ill luck you see how it is this is the only chance i ever had of working out a beautiful case and paf my criminal must go and fizzle a regular case of bankruptcy then it is clamorant who of course it is when the rascal saw me this morning he scampered off like a hare you should have seen him run i thought he would never stop this side of ivry but not at all on reaching the boulevard des Ecoles, a sudden idea seemed to strike him and he made a bee-line for his hotel i suppose to get his pile of money directly he gets here what does he see these three friends of mine the sight of these gentlemen had the effect of a sunstroke upon him he went raving mad on the spot the idea of serving me such a low trick at the very moment i was sure of success where is he now at the prefecture i suppose some policeman handcuffed him and drove off with him in a cab come with me m verduret and fanferlot found clamorant in one of the private cells reserved for dangerous prisoners he had on a straitjacket and was struggling violently against three men who were striving to hold him while the physician tried to force him to swallow a potion help he shrieked help for god's sake do you not see my brother coming after me look he wants to poison me m verduret took the physician aside and questioned him about the maniac the wretched man is in a hopeless state replied the doctor this species of insanity is incurable he thinks some one is trying to poison him and nothing will persuade him to eat or drink anything and as it is impossible to force anything down his throat he will die of starvation after having suffered all the tortures of poison m verduret with a shudder turned to leave the prefecture saying to fanferlot madame fauvel is saved and by the interposition of god who has himself punished clamorant that don't help me in the least grumbled fanferlot the idea of all my trouble and labour ending in this flat quiet way i seem to be born for ill luck don't take your blighted hopes of glory so much to heart replied m verduret it is a melancholy fact for you that file number one thirteen will never leave the record office but you must bear your disappointment gracefully and heroically i will console you by sending you as bearer of dispatches to a friend of mine and what you have lost in fame will be gained in gold twenty five 
four days had passed since the events just narrated when one morning m lecoq the official lecoq who resembled the dignified head of a bureau was walking up and down his private office at each turn nervously looking at the clock which slowly ticked on the mantel as if it had no intention of striking any sooner than usual to gratify the man so anxiously watching its placid face at last however the clock did strike and just then a faithful janouille opened the door and ushered in madame nina and prosper Bertomy. ah said m lecoq you are punctual lovers are generally so we are not lovers monsieur replied madame gypsy m verduret gave us express orders to meet here in your office this morning and we have obeyed very good said the celebrated detective then be kind enough to wait a few minutes i will tell him you are here during the quarter of an hour that nina and prosper remained alone together they did not exchange a word finally a door opened and m verduret appeared nina and prosper eagerly started toward him but he checked them by one of those peculiar looks which no one ever dared resist you have come he said severely to hear the secret of my conduct i have promised and will keep my word however painful it may be to my feelings listen then my best friend is a loyal honest man named caldas eighteen months ago this friend was the happiest of men infatuated by a woman he lived for her alone and fool that he was imagined that she felt the same love for him she did cried gypsy yes she always loved him she showed her love in a peculiar way she loved him so much that one fine day she left him and ran off with another man in his first moments of despair caldas wished to kill himself then he reflected that it would be wiser to live and avenge himself and then faltered prosper then caldas avenged himself in his own way he made the woman who deserted him recognize his immense superiority over his rival weak timid and helpless the rival was disgraced and falling over the verge of a precipice when the powerful hand of caldas reached forth and saved him you understand all now do you not the woman is nina the rival is yourself and caldas is with a quick dexterous movement he threw off his wig and whiskers and stood before them the real intelligent proud lecoq caldas cried nina no not caldas not verduret any longer but lecoq the detective m lecoq broke the stupefied silence of his listeners by saying to prosper it is not to me alone that you owe your salvation a noble girl confided to me the difficult task of clearing your reputation i promised her that m fauvel should never know the shameful secrets concerning his domestic happiness your letter thwarted all my plans and made it impossible for me to keep my promise i have nothing more to say he turned to leave the room but nina barred his exit caldas she murmured i implore you to have pity on me i am so miserable ah if you only knew be forgiving to one who has always loved you caldas listen prosper departed from m lecoq's office alone on the fifteenth of last month was celebrated at the church of notre dame de lorette the marriage of m prosper berthomy and mademoiselle madeleine fauvel the banking-house is still on the rue de provence but as m fauvel has decided to retire from business and live in the country the name of the firm has been changed and is now prosper berthomy and company End of chapter 25 End of file number 113 by Emile Gaborio Narrated by Céline Major I hope you've enjoyed this recording as much as I've enjoyed presenting it to you.